Pobola pobola mi. 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 Hi, I'm Mark Van Barker. I'm uh, from Broome. I grew up in Broome. I traditionally come from the Water Creek area. Uh, my mother was taken away at the age of three, and I have uh, Ngidja and Gunian family connections, and also the Jaro. Um, so basically, I come from pretty much central Kimberley. Um, Due to mum being taken away, I grew up in Broome all my life, born in Derby in Western Australia, and uh, uh, learnt, I guess, a lot of the uh, culture of the Yarrow people in this region, the Yarrow and Bali type culture. So that's had a big influence on who I am as an Aboriginal person. Um, but because my mother was taken, I lost a lot of language and culture and connection to family. So in my age now, I'm trying to reconnect with um, family country, language, um, and it's never an ending story I guess, but um, I think the only way I could really fast track it is to physically shift back to country, um, which um, is easier said than done I guess for me. Reason being is because the life that I live now, um, I bought a house here in Broome, um, I became um, very interested in music when I was a young man. Um, I was sent away to boarding school in Geraldton and, um, and then from there to Perth and um, in my hunger to play music um, I found that there was no avenue for Aboriginal musicians to follow their career and their art. So I uh, established an organisation or formed an organisation called Ab Music um, which still runs today, um, 20 something odd years later. So I'm pretty proud of that because it's uh, played an important role in the community for average and Torres Strait Islander people now, um, musicians, men and women, to get social diploma in music and to learn theory and understand the concepts of playing music properly and mastering the instruments. I wanted to be one of those students but I never got the chance to because uh, no one really saw the vision of what I was after and so I had to become the coordinator and, um, and that took its toll on me and uh, um, in, in many forms, and one of those forms, of course, was depression. And as a young man, I guess, um, uh, a grandfather came and stayed with me up in, down in Perth and said, it's time for you to go back home to Broome, uh, go back to country, basically. Um, so I decided to pack up and come back. And uh, when I came back to Broome, I, I decided that I was not going to be uh, involved in any uh, community-based organizations. I got drawn back into it. and. Uh, I um, <clears throat> became the coordinator for an organisation called Rural Musicians Aboriginal Corporation. And um, in that organisation I decided I wanted to do something spectacular and magic um, for Aboriginal people in the Kimberley. And so what was born out of that dream was Stone Ground Festival. Today it's been um, the only Indigenous event ever in Australia's history that was broadcast live um, from regional Australia three times and um, <clears throat> I've played a big role in all three of them. So the idea of um, having this event was about empowering our Indigenous artists, creating opportunities, um, creating exposure, and bringing in the big name acts to work on stage with our local Kimberley acts, uh, traditional dancing through to contemporary rock music. It was a huge success, and, um, and then through my journey I started doing radio. Um, as a volunteer um, and what came out of it was boredom in the studio one night and I started talking to myself in this woman's voice flirting with myself and this um, woman came to be what is known today as Mary G and it happened by accident, a few accidents, I didn't have any um, uh, aspirations to do what I'm doing today um, but the popularity of the character overwhelmed me um, to the point where people wanted to see it live, bearing in mind it was a radio character. So it got to the point where <clears throat> the public wanted to see this character live and I went, oh my god, how am I going to do this? 
and I played in a rock reggae band called Footprints, which was a pretty big band back in, in that era, um, in the 90s, um, early 90s. And um, uh, because I was a singer-songwriter and had the stage experience, um, I decided, because of demand, to have a crack at doing Mary G Live. And I didn't know what that meant and where it was going to go. I used to have a moustache and a goatee. And um, I thought, do I do an Auntie Jack type character? Uh, an Australian iconic character um, in the 70s, I think it was 70s, uh, late 60s, um, early 70s, of a man, a man dressed as a woman with a boxing glove in one hand. But I decided, no, um, that was too corny for me. And um, um, so I decided to buy myself the most, or the biggest bra I could possibly find on the market and um, uh, chose the colours of the Kimberley um, that I grew up with and ironically these are the colours here and uh, earth meaning the, the pin down dirt, the earth of the Kimberley and blue of course the ocean um, which is what I grew up surrounded by and, and within and um, the character uh, because I was a singer songwriter I was able to merge my songwriting in with the character and play the character and it was a natural progression for me. Um, I had no acting training, I had no uh, musical training for that matter as well, um, but I was pretty quick-witted, um, had a sense of humour and uh, never really took it all that serious, uh, but it just grew and grew from radio to live appearances. profile, um, its credibility, and, um, and part of that journey was bringing, writing a concept, um, the original Bible of a thing called the Mary D Show. And we pitched it to the ABC and um, they didn't really buy it because they had just purchased LED at the time. Um, so they were a bit conservative for something like a black man dressed as a woman. Um, and uh, I just finished a documentary with SBS. Um, through Galari and uh, a documentary I wrote and directed based on um, a father and son relationship and in that re in the delivery I spoke to the commissioning editor who said look I'm keen about the Mary D show and let's give it a crack and uh, so we did a, a series and um, um, that was successful it was new it was breaking new ground there was no such thing on television like that a lot of people who didn't watch it kind of said what the hell is this you know and is that a man or woman and all sorts of uh, interesting things. It really touched not only the indigenous community but it touched um, uh, the ethnic community as well in Australia. Um, mainstream Australia was kind of still a bit weary. Um, what was against us at the time was um, it was on SBS TV which meant that original Australia didn't really get a chance to, to watch it unless you had, um, you had, you had your antennas and stuff like that. Um, so it got a limited um, airplay, did it cycle, and uh, was a huge success, and I won a couple of awards for that. And um, but in the early days, when I started to realise how um, how people were attracted to Mary G, um, I also learned very quickly the power of it. 
and the influence I had on in particularly uh, Aboriginal people. Dreaming, well, uh, maybe la we sing in that crabbery. Woman sing in crabbery, long and long each time. From dreaming, right through till today. We're gonna keep going all the way. Keep that culture, long and we all. It's important that we collectively understand the significance of Mary G in the Australian landscape, in mainstream Australia, Indigenous Australia. And uh, what I've found is that I've become um, an iconic symbol of social emotional well-being, of health and health messages, um, using hip wit, sorry, using wit, humour, and fun, um, and the character to make people feel good and feel proud about who they are. Because for so long, Aboriginal people have been made to feel like they're inferior since colonization. And, um, and of course, obviously, the darker you are, or the blacker you are, the more so. And I've uh, uh, dreamt this and dreamed this and um, uh, felt the pain of my ancestors and my uh, family that exists today still of full blood heritage full blood Aboriginal heritage who don't have privileges and opportunities that I've had, that uh, using the character creates those doors to open and create opportunities and, and get our people to realise that the greatest commodity and collateral they have in their life is themselves and to turn that into something that they can be proud about, to make a difference in their community, make a difference for their children and to remove the shackle of shame and inferiority of being a black person. Um, that we can achieve anything. And I know it's easier said than done for a person of my colour, but um, you've got to start somewhere and you've got to empower your people. And through my leadership and my style and through Mary G, I've been able to do that successfully. So that's the passion that drives who I am and what I do as Mary G. Um, and it's a fantastic uh, platform for me to do that in. And of course, taking advantage of all mediums, whether it's radio, whether it's television, whether it's live performances, whether it's public speaking um, as Mark, um, and um, any other aspects, whether it's um, through print media, um, whatever it may be, that I'm able to use my face or Mary T's face to make a difference um, for our people. Hello Mary, how are you? I'm okay. You look a bit worse for wear, poor thing, what are you? <laughs> you look a bit sick yourself, what are you? I've been waiting too long to see the doctor. I'm going to die waiting, will you? Well, we're all full up today and the doctors are working flat out. But if you wish to complain, see that poster over there that Brian just put up? It has a number on it you can ring now if you wish to complain. What, you asking me to dobby mob in? Yes, Mary. This way we get the feedback so we can improve the service. It's no good downing us outside to people. Make a report to the Health Consumers Council and they will then talk to our senior people to improve or rectify or even look into the report. Won't that get you mob into trouble? No, my dear. This is the way we work now, so you can get a better service. All medical services call this transparency to you, the client. You report or complain and we, the Medical Service and the Health Consumers Council, work together to improve the situation. That's right. How do you know? Well, I came in for an appointment once here and when I went to leave, they tried to give me a bill and said I hadn't paid it from my first visit. But I ne I'd never been here before. So I just rang the Health Consumers Council and they sorted it out straight away. And it did work? Yeah. I didn't have to worry about much at all. Ah, oh, well, I'm going to go read it. Hey. Oh, hello, Mary. How are you? I'm fine. I just want to have a look at this poster here. That's good, Mary, because we're trying to improve the quality of service to our countrymen, even for you. Well, countrymen, there you go. Do you have an issue with your local medical service? Maybe you're not happy? Well, now there's a way of improving the service to you, the client.
In partnership with your local medical service and the Health Consumer Council, they wish to provide a special service just for you. The people who use the medical services. This service is neutral. This means you should feel comfortable when reporting incidents or dissatisfaction in the services. Brian, what is the Health Consumer Council? The Health Consumer Council, Mary, is an independent organization representing the consumer's voice in policy, planning, research, and service delivery. And why was it set up? Mary, it was set up to give our countrymen a voice in the health system. You're a smart man, very handsome. About time you started doing something good. Well, it's important, Mary. It sure is, darling. And we need to get things right and good for our people. And this is a good start. The sooner we get this happening, the better the services will become. Yep, you got it right, Mary. Your local medical service and the Health Consumer Council see this as a way of improving the services to you. Sometimes your local medical centre is so busy providing the service that they don't see the problems or the issues that's affecting you, the client. So now, me and you have a means of complaining or reporting to improve the service. That's teamwork. The medical service, the Health Consumer Council and you can make it work. Soon I'll have nothing to complain about. Maybe I should marry Brian, then I'll have something to complain about. What do you reckon, Brian? Me and you, a great team? I'll think about it, Mary. I think you're a bit too big for me. <laughs> Don't let my size fool you, sweetheart. You never say that last time. I'll give you health consumer. <laughs> what are you? Let's all make medical services a better service. One big partnership. Better services, better health. Once I realised the, um, the power and the credibility that Mary G had established um, as a character, I realised uh, the responsibility I had. And because of the influence of the character on Aboriginal Australians um, and the reconciliatory aspect of the character um, for mainstream Australia, that I immediately decided in an early point that um, I was going to use Mary G to create social change for our people. Um, in all forms, whether it's health, political um, and reconciliatory, but also play a part in being a voice for Aboriginal people in mainstream Australia. And, uh, and using wit, music um, and humour um, um, to be able to use those mechanisms to, to play the character. Hey Mary, how are you feeling? Good enough for me and Bobby McGee. Were well, you jealous of me? <laughs> hey Mob, don't forget to come for checkup. Well, I'm all right. I feel good. Nothing wrong with me. Nothing well, come for a checkup anyway, Mary. You might feel good, but inside you might be getting sick. Women got to have checkup all the time to be safe. Well, come on then. I need lift arm anyway. I like go for checkup. <laughs> come on. Mary, can I do? Yeah, that's me. Don't use my name in vain. Mary, lucky you came in today. You could have had big problems. You know, even if you feel good inside, it's still important to have those regular checkups. Prevention is better than cure, eh, Mary? That's right. Hey, countrymen, you must always have a checkup. You never know what's going on inside your body. Anything can make you sick. You must always feel safe. Now run for another hundred years. Right, Jan? What are you? Get the checkup, get the checkup, get the checkup. Right now. And it's been an um, interesting journey because I've been to just about every Aboriginal community in Australia since then, right across Australia. It's taken me to some amazing amazing places, um, um, amazing tribal grounds, um, language groups right across Australia, the diversity of Indigenous Australia is awesome. And I'm very privileged, I'm very privileged because um, um, along with the power and the capacity of the character, um, there's a uh, social responsibility. Country, hey. what you doing? Come for a check up in the clinic? Gotta make sure I'm more fit and healthy. Ah, you might just guessing. I look sick or what? I'm not a dying dog. Ah, uh, come on. 
We'll take you there. You'll never, ever know if you never go. OK, then. Let's go. Make sure you might drop me home after, though. Johnny Jumbody. Oh, yeah. Johnny Jumbody. Oh, yeah, that's me. I'm not anybody. I'm Jumbody. Johnny, just as well you came in. Any longer, and it may have been too late. Make sure you come back for checkup all the time. Hey, country! How you go with your test last week? Six four, look. That doctor reckon Jumbody good as gold. Lucky he went. Yeah, doctor reckon I'm gonna eat healthy food. Stay away from grog, smokes, and all that rubbish. And I'm like that, deadly. And you know what? Nicole Kidman not looking for Russell Crowe. She looking for this black crow. <laughs> <laughs> It's always what Mark Bambaka, you know, the person always was anyway. And I think um, I, as, as Mark, probably uh, probably would have done the same thing, but it would have been harder. And I'd probably not achieve as much as I've achieved today with the character. For some reason, it's, uh, I, well, for some reason the character has been embraced as a high ma a matriarch in Indigenous Australia. Um, everybody loves Mary G, you can go to just about any Aboriginal community in Australia and they all know Mary G. And uh, they call me Wadiya, Wadiya, and all sorts of different ways of uh, acknowledging Mary G. The Douglas Lady Gladys, the first black governor and governess. We can all be heroes if we allow ourselves to be. We can all be heroes, young and old. We can all be heroes, every boy. Believe in ourselves. We can all be heroes. Mr. Eddie Mabo, Conquer Terra Nalia, Mr. Neville Bonner, stood in the Great Hall, Mr. Charlie Perkins. Was a great visionary, <laughs> Mr. Rob Riley. Was a true believer. We can all be heroes if we believe in ourselves. We can all be heroes, young and old. We can all be. We can all be heroes. 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 And you, and you, and you, and, and you. me. I think that uh, uh, our people have been made to feel like they're inferior for a long time since colonisation. And um, modern Australia's never really made 100% um, commitment to empowering um, Aboriginal people in this country. What our people got to understand is that their language, for example, is the oldest in the world. <clears throat> their culture is oldest, the oldest in the world. It's scientifically proven. The first human beings to walk on this planet 
that come out of Africa, if you believe in the movement of man, the first human beings on this planet was the Australian Aboriginal, scientifically proven. Um, <clears throat> in terms of open sea travel, in South America, they found um, 13,000 year old skulls that is of Australian Aboriginal um, origin. So the theory is that um, Aboriginal people travelled across the Pacific to South America and there's an island that still has descendants of those original Aboriginal people. So our, our people have got to stand up and be proud that all of these layers makes us the most unique in the world. And no disrespect to other cultures and other races in the world. Um, and our people got to embrace the fact that um, uh, black people of this continent or this island or this place called Australia um, hails back beyond the Bible, beyond Stonehenge and beyond the pyramids. Um, and we, we were survivors. And we lived in perfect balance with the environment, absolute perfect balance. And most importantly, we are natural Christians in our natural state before Christianity was even uh, created. Um, because our culture tells us that we must share, we must care. We have um, a system that keeps a balance in terms of who we are and where we sit within our tribal groups or clan groups. Perfect balance. All of that was fractured by Western culture. We've got to pick up the pieces. Um, we've been traumatized. We've been, um, our souls have been destroyed, so to speak. What we've got to do is acknowledge all that history and be proud of that history because at the end of the day, it's those, that sacrifice of our people that's what built this nation. That's our contribution. And um, we can talk about the First World War and the Second World War, but what about the wars before colonization at that point and the, and the sacrifice of our people? So we're richer today because of that history. Right or wrong, good or bad, we can't change it. We have to own it as black people. We have to own it as a nation in this country. Australia has to own that history as well because it does not belong to just Aboriginal people. That history belongs to history. It belongs to Australia, it belongs to the world. And our people, through our art, whether it's dance, whether it's song, whether it's um, um, all the aspects that make up our culture, is something that the world wants the world is screaming out for and we must come to terms with the fact that we are worth a hell of a lot and the world wants what we have to offer and it's so important that we realize the value calling 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 for the roots of my people calling 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 for the roots of my people For the roots of my people Where are they? Where do they keep? They know who I am I call out from within They know who I am Cause I call out from within Still holding out I have to find them Cause I don't want to be left out For time is getting on now And time can never tell Of all the pain and misery That they've gone and felt Please, oh people, recognize I'm calling out this time the pain and the misery that you felt is not a fault of mine. Not a fault of mine.
Please all people recognize that we must live as one. We have got to stand and fight and live beneath one sun. For time is getting on now and time can never tell of all the pain and misery inflicted by the bloodiest hell. Once I learned the, um, the, the, the power of Mary Jean and also the, the responsibility I had to have with Mary Jean playing a black woman, converting that into a brand, um, I was able to make a living from it. And making a living is now stepping into the realm of business. And this is a good example of Aboriginal people realising their special gift, their special niche to be able to convert that into a sustainable business for themselves, make a living for it for themselves. Whether it's a tribe and their dance group, whether it's a band and their songs and going on the road and touring, whether you're a poet, you're a storyteller, whatever it may be. Realising the value of what you've got as a black person and convert that into a business uh, and into a brand. So once I've converted Mary G into a brand, I set up a company called Mary G Mary G Enterprises, Priority Limited, and there's a lot of demand on me because of my social uh, commitments since the day I started, 20 years before Mary G, um, um, making a difference for our community. And so when I started uh, Mary G Enterprises, I realised <clears throat> as while I was earning an income and sustaining myself, that I was still passion of making a difference was still sitting inside of me. So I didn't have business greed, which is a um, probably an important component of good business. Business means greed. One, once I, um, well, I was becoming successful as a small business um, using the brand of Mary G and Mary G Priority Limited doing business with the world, so to speak. <coughs> The other part of me, the social responsibility and the commitment to my people was still lingering inside of my soul, inside of my subconscious coming to my conscious mind, um, that I formed an entity to take on the philanthropic ambitions that I wanted to do. And so I established an organisation called Mary G Foundation, which has DGR status, which means that it's um, people with money corporates, philanthropists, whatever it may be, um, <laughs> is, uh, they could make a contribution and claim that back through tax. And the monies that come in I can use to make a difference for um, my indigenous community. So I have two entities now, Mary G Enterprises Proprietary Limited and of course uh, Mary G Foundation, which has a separate board and operates uh, arm's length from me, obvious reasons. Um, and with the two, I'm able to make a difference the best I can um, using my brand to assist the other entity to be able to support new and emerging artists and established artists and, and to seeing themselves as a commodity, seeing themselves as something to offer the world and convert that into dollars. Um, so now I'm going down the path of setting up a record label which I've already established, the Wadi Our Music. I've, um, and you can find all this on my website, www.maryg.com. Um, so you've got the, in the merchandise tab, you go to my record label, What Are Our Music. I have a, on trial at the moment, um, online radio, uh, What Are Our Music. Uh, sorry, What Are Our Radio. <clears throat> I'm hoping to set up a festival, the What Are Our Festival, um, which is set up to promote new and emerging artists and train them and assist them into a higher level of musicianship as well. Um, and continue doing my philanthropy or philanthropic work for my indigenous community, but at the same time sustaining myself in, in a corporate world, in, a, in, a, in business. And so um, right now, the whole gamut of media plays an important role, an intricate role in, in making me successful. And um, I've done most of this with very limited government money, um, um, but good, good acronym and good um, 
um, sorry, good work ethics, good principles, and uh, transparency and good accountability in business um, as uh, Mary G Enterprise Private Limited. I think long term, um, I'd like to grow, and it sounds like it's empire building, maybe it is, but the whole idea is to use my brand um, as much as I can to touch other people. And what inspired me a long, long time ago was a story of um, these two old people in America who was looking in a glass showroom at a Cadillac. And um, they were pensioners and they were just watching these beautiful cars. And this car pulled up outside. And this man got out and said to them, um, oh, you're going to buy yourself a Cadillac. And uh, um, the old people said, no, we're not. We're just looking because we love it. And it would be a dream for us to own a car like that. So the man walked in and bought a Cadillac, came out and gave them the keys. And that man was Elvis Presley. Now, to be able to touch people like that is what drives me. To be able to touch people and make a difference for people, um, whether it's through information, through financial support, or whatever it may be, so that they can change their life, which is going to affect the future of their gen generations. And that's my dream, and that's my motivation, and that's why I love doing what I'm doing. Because, uh, and it's still a long journey, because whilst that's my dream and journey, I've still got to climb to a certain level to be able to give it back down to that level. So um, I may reach it, I may never reach it, I don't know. But you, you've got to have a dream and you've got to start somewhere. So any corporates out there who uh, understand comprehensives and also wants, either wants to be known or wants to be a silent uh, contributor, you've got the, the Mary G Foundation to contribute to. Uh, make a difference in your business from a taxation point of view through the DGR status and um, um, make a difference for the indigenous community and you can do that and uh, that's what the whole idea is about this uh, concept of um, the foundation and Mary G and Mary G Enterprises working together to make a difference for everybody. Um, that's my dream and, and I, I have a good Leon in here that guides me to achieve this. Um, but it's still a dream and um, unfortunately most of the um, tools you need to make this happen is money and so people with wealth um, including government through subsidy um, and through application that they can assist me by being involved or being an outsider involved. Martin Luther King had a dream that everyone would be equal in America. Marcus Garvey had a dream that Africa would be united. Um, I have a dream, and my dream for my country, Australia, is that it can rise above its history because the psyche of racism is still embedded in people's DNA of their attitude towards Aboriginal people. So my dream for Australia is that Aboriginal people be given the true form of support to rise above um, and become the most important valuable asset, collateral and uniqueness in, to offer to the world um, that celebrates this nation. And all Australians stand behind this and support and uh, have a sense of ownership and celebration of this unique and oldest culture in the world, the Australian Aboriginal. That's what my dream is for Australia, equality at the highest level.
so healthy and so good. Nah. <laughs> <laughs>